welcome back to a special episode of The Bourbon Lens, and we are featuring a good friend, the Whiskey Lore Podcast. But more importantly, we're going to be talking about a variety of things. But this is Drew Hanish, like Spanish, and just a little bit about Drew. He's a best-selling author of the Whiskey Lore's Travel Guide to Experiencing Kentucky Bourbon and the host of both Whiskey Lore and Travel Fuel's Life Podcast. So, Drew, thanks for joining this episode of The Bourbon Lens. Thank you so much for inviting me in. This is... Uh Fun and cozy, and there's a lot of Irish whiskey in this room. Somewhere, I don't know where all this came from. <laughs> I, I I like to keep Scott on his toes. He doesn't know what I have all at all times. But the international section of of the Llewellyn whiskey collection has gotten larger. <laughs> it's crowding out some of the bourbon. Uh, some of the bourbon needs to go. <laughs> just just needs needs to go. There's too much world whiskey to to enjoy to only focus on bourbon. You probably have some audience members right now that are going, okay, we're here if you want to get rid of that bourbon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, my, my wife wants to know where those audience members are so that it can be gone. That's uh, true, too. She's like, when are we getting rid of some of this whiskey? I'm like, I'm trying to go to people's houses and leave it, but they just... <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, there, there was there was a, a buddy that came in from out of town, and, and they drove in from Chicago, and I found like the biggest... like old Lulu lemon bag. Cause those just happened to like carry things around really well. And I put nine bottles of whiskey in there. His <laughs> wife's looking at me like I'm crazy. I'm like, are you sure? And I'm like, yes, just go, just, just leave, <laughs> just go, just leave my child. Um, no, but it, it's fun. I'm sure, you know, you probably have this problem as you've traveled around and tasted a variety of different whiskeys that you have a few bottles at your house in South Carolina. So it's funny because I people will come over and they'll say, so where do you keep all this whiskey? And then I walk over to my big, tall kitchen cabinets and I start opening doors and they're like, holy cow. And they're like, where are your dishes? That's I show them one little half of the cabinet <laughs> where I put my dishes. Sorry. We've got, but, we've got two glasses, two cups. Yes, you know. I have my priorities yeah. and my priorities are not the dishes. Uh, Chinette was on sale at Kroger and we were good. <laughs> <laughs> Behind cabinet number five. Yeah. 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 So, and then now it's to the cabinets below the sink. So it's like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I built a bar and then a, a secondary bar and both of them got filled up very quickly. And my wife said, what are we going to do with all this whiskey? And I said, oh, <laughs> see if you build a shelf you'll put like a shit on it <laughs> and things will appear yeah on it. yeah, yeah know, she's like i didn't think we were gonna have all these bottles out on this shelf when we built these shelves and i'm like what did you want me to do with them <laughs> yeah can i squeeze another bottle in there just move it over a little bit yeah you know what's the old saying from field of dreams if you build it they will come that's yeah. true too if you podcast they will show up <laughs> yes yes that is very true this is very true so yeah. you know before we dive into this uh, you have a, a really interesting background in general but one of the the main things is you're a James Bond fanatic mm-hmm. um, so there's two important questions that you must ask anyone <laughs> um, who is a James Bond fanatic w- who is your favorite bond and what is your favorite movie okay. So I I should answer the favorite Bond because you've already told me who my decision is supposed to be. It's got to be Connery. (laughs) (laughs) Let me put it this way. It was Daniel Craig, Mm. but he slid off towards the end. Ah. I got a little disinterested in the way the it was kind of progressing Ah. because my favorite movie is Casino Royale. Very well. Very, very well done movie. Yeah. Um, Big fan of Casino Royale. I mean, it's just like Connery. Just Pierce Brosnan would probably be my second. I just liked. I thought Pierce did a really good job. He just fit the the build for yeah. me. So I like to say most underrated because I've read the books too. Yeah, is Timothy Dalton. Yeah, because Timothy Dalton tried to do what Daniel Craig did do in the early films. It's of, of his series. The problem was that he was coming after Roger Moore, who was Mr. Slapstick. Yeah. And the audience just was not ready for man-eating sharks and, uh, you know. And he he's a Shakespearean actor, so he didn't quite come across as the debonair guy. But if you read the books, he wasn't debonair. He was supposed to be just a plain Jane, you know, blunt instrument. And yeah. that, that was it. He was not <laughs> supposed to be this fashiony guy it only changed towards the latter books because Fleming started seeing what uh Terrence Young was doing to his character 
in yeah. the movies. And so he started sliding into that style. Hmm. So, yeah, no, Bond is fascinating. I was, I remember when TBS would show like the James Bond marathon or USA network would do that. And you know, I'd, I'd catch it. And then like, I'd be looking at the, before like the TV guide, you'd have the book, right? You get the book for the week or whatever. Oh yeah. And it would just be like octopus. And I thought that was so funny. <laughs> <laughs> Me and what, 10, 12 years oh, old. You're like, yep. I'm like, dad, what is this? Like, this sounds like it should be on TV. And he's like, uh, it's James Bond. You'll, you'll, you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is excusable yeah. when it's James Bond. Yeah. And then, you know, he, uh, he ruined all the shaken, not stirred, uh, people because that's how a cocktail is now made is mostly stirred. Yeah. Shaken is not the way to, to make a cocktail. So James Bond screwed a lot of people a, on that one. A friend of mine who is a really big fan of James Bond told me one time, he said, um, you, you cannot, you should not chill your, or you shouldn't put it on ice. The ice is what, uh, dilutes it. And that's the problem is that you're diluting the drink and you're not getting the full experience of it if you, but I like it chilled. So it creates an issue for me because mm. I sort of like it that way. I make a Vesper martini, so I, I make it following his instructions yeah. and, um, and really like it shaken, not stirred. But then I start thinking about it when I start thinking about whiskey and I, the way I teach people to drink whiskey, you know, is you can start with ice but you should slowly try to move yourself out of ice because you're just diluting the whiskey down and, you know, plus colder temperatures reduce the flavor impact. So then I put that to my martini and I went, oh, oh, damn, it. <laughs> damn it. Damn it. Yeah. That doesn't but you can work. have it both ways. Yeah. That's fine. Exactly. When I'm home by myself, nobody knows but me. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and you know what? There's no wrong way to drink your whiskey. Yeah. Whatever you're in the mood for, I'm a. Uh, I finally got to a point where some of the bourbons that were a little harsher for me that just sat in the cabinet and I I wouldn't drink them. Uh, I just start putting on ice in the summertime. Mm. It's like that's when I'm going to drink these whiskeys because I'm not a cocktail guy. So it's like the martini is as far as I go with cocktails. Yeah. yeah. So I want to be a cocktail guy, but there's way too many steps to making a cocktail <laughs> to make a, a neat pour of whiskey you open bottle and pour it in done yeah <laughs> no grab clean glass yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. Well, it can be partially dirty it's it's the sugar for me is, yeah is that the sugar and whiskey do not mix for me in fact my my early story was i didn't drink whiskey for 20 years because of a bad jack daniels experience mm -hmm. and that's when i was mixed it was i had been drinking it straight and then I started drinking it with Coke. Yeah. And one night I drank a lot of it with Coke. Mm. And that pretty You found the finished. porcelain yes. palace and it was rough. That I, finished I, it for me. I started drinking gin because I had a couple of those nights with Jim Beam white label. Seven seven year white label. Mm. I uh, I did that with vodka one night and I've never went back, but you know <laughs> that's a good thing. I think there's there's a reason why I don't really care for Jim Beam all that often. Yeah. But, Oh man, let's not talk about Jim Beam because Jim Beam put out the best four Booker's batches in a row. I had the fourth one the other the other day. It was good, but yeah, again, it's just not my. Typical. I mean, for ninety nine dollars, it's getting a little out of hand. I actually had it this morning. There okay, you, I did the Jim Beam tour this morning. So. There we go. And it's funny because they give you a chance to pick between three different whiskeys uh, for your final taste. It's Legion, which I like. Baker's seven, which I like mm -hmm. and bookers. Well, I'm sorry. If you're going to give me bookers on that list, I'm always going to go with the bookers. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're looking at a $35 bottle. You're looking at a $60 bottle and then a $90 <laughs> bottle. Right. That's true. Yeah. Like you let's, gotta, gotta find your value, especially yeah. knowing because do they still do the push button where you get the, the thing? Maybe that was the last time we talked about this. They, they revised their tour like six times in yeah, five years, yeah. but they used to do like where they would give you like a card and you would go up and RFID it and maybe you get three pours. Oh. You could go to any of the stations yeah, and it would pour out the perfect amount. They've taken the gift shop that's above yeah. and turned it into a tasting room and a, uh, mm -hmm. uh, well, see, we've been there, we've been there, but not done the tour since they revised it. But okay. no, we went to the, the kitchen table though. And 
That was amazing. The mm. food there is phenomenal. Mm. They, they, they make their pizza dough with the actual yeast from the... That's cool. Yeah. But we're not here to talk about bourbon. <laughs> For we some for some reason, <laughs> yeah, you you come you come to Kentucky. We didn't even mention that. Yeah, yeah we're we're live and in person. Yeah, yeah. We got Drew all the way up here. He stopped in Tennessee. Yeah, some for some reason for some reason, <laughs> and uh, he, he made his he made his way up to Kentucky. And um, you know, Drew is is a lot of things, but a storyteller. You are, I think, first and foremost. Um, that's the way I look at it. Um, and every bit of a claim and credit that you've gotten is because I think you're a phenomenal storyteller. I was telling Scott before you got here, when I'm going to listen to a podcast, I want to listen to someone who tells a story. I think you do a phenomenal job telling a story. So we're, we're excited to talk about the stories that you've created based upon your experiences going to Ireland. And, um, what's really cool about that is I've been there, but when I went there, I didn't do any Irish whiskey things. I went to, um, you know, have a, a, a pint, of, of Guinness. And that was about the, the only thing I really did. Which no. about half of Ireland says that Guinness is not the best. Right. right. Exactly. Yeah. No, no, they're, cork, they're all into their Beamish and yeah. uh, Murphy's. But, Murphy's so good. Oh, but man. I will tell you this, you've never had a Guinness until you've had a Guinness from Ireland with the, with the, with the nitrous, um, you know, oxide pushback. So, and it just raises the foam. It's, it's a beautiful drink. Yeah. Um, but you know, Ireland is, is the fastest growing, or Irish whiskey is the fastest growing spirit in the world. So there's got to be something happening on that little island yeah. that's former former potato farmers, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. So like, talk to us a little bit about how you got into the idea of, I'm going to go to Ireland and I'm going to write a book on it. Well, it kind of goes back to, uh, just to bring up Kentucky again, it goes back to how I learned about bourbon, which was I planned a trip to Kentucky I went to 19 distilleries in eight days to just immerse myself in it and get to know all about it. And uh, I was amazed at what I came out of Kentucky with. And Whiskey Lore was part of what came out of that because I was so fascinated uh, by the history. And I was working on and had been to Scotland twice. And during those two trips, I'd gone to about 45 distilleries. And so I was on my way to writing a book about um, scotch after I'd gotten done with the Kentucky book. But then COVID hit and I was like, okay, you know, what do I do? Well, that's, I started going to Tennessee. I hadn't covered Tennessee before. And uh, I had thought about Ireland, but Ireland was going to have to wait until after all of this. My opinion on Irish whiskey at that time was I knew Jameson, I knew Redbreast, but I wasn't, I knew Bushmills, I knew Tullamore Dew, and I knew that I didn't really like any of them. I mean, I, Redbreast, yeah, to a certain degree, but I couldn't understand why everybody else was all crazy about it. For me, it was like, yeah, but there was this weird thing about Irish whiskey that I would always pick up this um, solvent note. Like, uh, I, I always say when I was untrained that it was like gasoline, like a little bit of gasoline in this. And where is that coming from? And why am I finding this in all Irish whiskeys that I drink? And so I avoided Irish whiskey for a long time. And then I, when I started hearing about the explosion of distilleries over there, I had gone to Ireland on one of my uh, trips to Scotland and talking about beer and, and Ireland. When I went on that trip, I was like, okay, I'm flying into Dublin. I'm going to go to Glasgow, but why don't I spend four days in Ireland and see castles here? So this was still under the travel fuels life, which was my original podcast and uh, journey of, of going through and doing all this travel. And so, um, my opinion at that time was that Ireland is for beer, Scotland <laughs> is for whiskey. And if you've had Scottish beer, and I'll offend you some know people, that. I'm sure I'll say, <laughs> people will know that tenants, I don't know about that stuff. <laughs> um, so, but Guinness, uh, for me, Guinness is, uh, it's the one beer I still, it's a comfort food for me. Mm. Yeah. So when I went there, I went to one distillery in Ireland. I went to Dingle Distillery. Yeah. And other than that, 
the entire trip was going to see castles and finding the perfect perfect Guinness. <laughs> and so I went to every little pub I could um, go to, and I was trying Guinness <clears throat> all over the place. And what I found was the Guinness was better the further you got from Dublin. So tip there. Hmm. <laughs> Actually, the worst one I had was at St. James Gate. Really? Which I think was the one I, I poured it for myself, so I don't know if I did something wrong. <laughs> you screwed it up. That's I what they're going to say. I screwed it up myself. <laughs> yeah. Now, now, since I've been back, the best one I've ever had is in Belfast. Oh. So, uh -huh. yeah, there's a Biddle's Bar. Now, it's for those not familiar, that's we, that's Northern Ireland. That's Northern Ireland. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, excellent, though. Boy. Yeah. Well, and, and you can pretty much go anywhere and find a pint of Guinness. Um, like we went to the cliffs and there's like a little shop outside the cliffs of Moore and you can walk in there and you can get a pint yeah. <laughs> even right there. And I'm like, I wouldn't recommend getting a pint of Guinness near the cliffs. Like <laughs> probably a bad idea. Well, people in Ireland drink Guinness. Like people stop at Starbucks every day right? Yeah, for breakfast, exactly. lunch or dinner. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if I watch an Irish movie and I see him pull out a pint of Guinness, I, I, I'm it's I crave, yeah. You know, your mouth like, starts salivating. Yeah. Oh man, don't do that to me. No, yeah. yeah. But uh, but when I went to Dingle, I asked about the distilleries in the country, and I said, "How many distilleries are there here?" And they almost seemed like they didn't really know. I mean, they said, "Well, we're helping out another uh, startup," um, but other than that, said there's Teeling and there's a handful, right? Yeah, and there's Kilbeg and then there's Tullamore Dew and. Uh, and even then, I think, you know, Tullamore Dew was actually, um, before William Grant had it, I think they were making it at Middleton. So it was a lot of that stuff was coming out of Middleton. And because the majority of Irish whiskey was coming out of Middleton for yeah. the last some odd years, this was the Well, this was the shock, was that, uh, what, 1960, there was an article, I think, in the New York Times that uh, asked people about Irish whiskey, and most of the responses were, Ireland, Ireland makes whiskey. Uh, that's how bad it got. I mean, it got to a point where there wasn't any on the shelf. Jameson was the reintroduction of Irish whiskey to the world. And Jameson was, um, I mean, it was uh, the, um, the start was slow and they only had two distilleries. There was Bush mills and there was Middleton. And those were the only two distilleries until Cooley distillery came along with John Teeling in 1987. Okay. So you're talking about a long run there with almost out, 20 years, right? Yeah. More than that. Uh, Kilbegan shut down in 1957. Okay. So around 57, 54, 57, somewhere in there and Tullamore do at the same time. So it's after that, uh, there was one more Northern Irish, uh, Irish one, I think, uh, Col Colrain, which I think shut down in the sixties or seventies. Mm. And then that was it. It was just down to two distilleries. The monsters. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, and that was on purpose because they wanted to try to save the industry. And they said, the only way we can do this is to stop fighting each other and just join together. So powers and that's why powers is made by Middleton. It was a, it was its own family brand forever. Roe was a, the Roe family um, for a century and a half making whiskey and they all just set up thrown in the towel we'll all join yeah. together. Yeah. So. so I think what's really important for people to understand before we get into like the brands and the, the, the distinction, um, cause it's a lot like Scotland, right? Cause there's different areas and different types of, of Irish whiskey being made in those areas. Right. From, from what I understand. Not so much. It's uh, I mean, cause you had James on and James was talking about the West coast and uh, Ulster were kind of known for their peated, whiskey, which is true. Uh, the whole, I, I, all of Ireland at one point was probably using peat because it takes coal. Yeah. And how do you transport coal? So it was the transportation of coal that became the issue. Yeah. And that's why the cities like Belfast would start earlier. Mm -hmm. Derry would start earlier. Dublin would start earlier because they could get the coal. It was not, it wasn't inland. Once you start going inland, it became harder to get the supply of coal. So they just distilled with what they had, which was peat. Okay. Uh, or turf. Yeah. Uh, in turf. their case. Yeah. <laughs> let's, so, let's clarify. Yeah. In Ireland, exactly. It's, it's turf. So, um, and what's interesting about Scotland is that Scotland, really, the regions are starting to diverse, diversify as yeah. well. But uh, 
Yeah, there's not. Uh, you might get sort of a coastal influence from some areas of uh, of Ireland. Yeah, but for the most part, Ireland was known for pot still whiskey, mm. and that's what made it famous. And then pot still whiskey died out completely. Now people don't know what pot still whiskey is. They'll buy a red breast, but they don't know what pot still means. Yeah. So that's the thing. John's Lane we have sitting here now from Powers, and that's a pot still whiskey. Yeah. Um, and so people missed out on what the character of that is, which is it, usually it's an, an oilier whiskey. Mm-hmm. It usually has a grain forward flavor. I get a lot of lemon out of some of them, citrusy lemon. And then it has a peppery note on the finish Mm -hmm. that comes through. And that's all from the unmalted barley that they're using. So it's, you you could say it's a single malt in a way, but it's malted barley and unmalted barley. And it's that unmalted barley that gives it the character Mm -hmm. and makes it so interesting. And so that gets into the question of the delineation between Scotch and Irish, right? Because you know, not, we won't get in, we won't ask you to, to put a line in the sand and saying who made whiskey first, uh, on this podcast. I do have an answer for that, by the way. Well, if you have an answer, let's, let's have it. It's on page seven. seven. I actually do mention it in that because I have a little history in that book. Um, there's a squabble between the two, of course, of who did it first, but a lot of Scots will acquiesce and say it was the Irish. It came up through Spain and the monks brought it up, the stills up into Ireland. And that's the traditional story. What that story misses is that earlier than that, they were distilling in Italy. The school of Salerno was doing distillation way before that. And the monks of um, the, the area where Ulster is and where Kintyre Peninsula is, where Campbelltown is in Scotland, Mm -hmm. that was a kingdom called Dalriada. And that kingdom was actually, um, Iona is a island in Scotland or is in an area near the Isle of Mull. And that is where the kingdoms uh, was centered. So these Celtic Christians were always going into Europe and they were probably bringing that skill back with them earlier, which means that it's actually probably more true that it was a brotherhood of the Scots and the Irish that brought it back together. Huh. That would be my that, – it's not provable yeah. at this point, but – I leave it open to that because I think there is a possibility that, uh, well, I mean, we're talking hundreds and hundreds yeah, that of was years, five, five, 600 years six, ago, 680. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, when that, when the kingdom was there and then it's time after that, that the, um, missionaries and the, uh, Christians were all going down into Europe from yeah. there. So well, that's the one thing I found fascinating about like drawing, similarities or differences between American whiskey and European whiskey, I guess we could say is the, the history of American whiskey is really just a couple hundred years old. Yeah. But what's fascinating about it is as an industry, we're as old as Ireland and Scotland, because when you look at those labels on those bottles, Jameson 1780. And what's interesting is that, George Washington's distiller yeah. left Scotland for the same reason that John Jameson left Scotland. <laughs> and they both went off to start distilling, but in two different countries. Yeah. And then he started distilling rye. Yeah. 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 I, 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 it, it's so fascinating because I feel like that might be the one spot where America isn't young compared to the rest of the world is our love for it alcohol. <laughs> um, because like it, it's, it's been, you know, something in, you know, it's our native spirit is what, you know, bourbon is. And there's a lot of passion and then like per case volume, it just doubles and triples what these guys are doing, which yeah. is, well, it's our, crazy. it's our love for alcohol and our hate for taxes. Yeah. <laughs> right? and I mean, there's a lot of similarities in whiskey stories about yeah. the hate of taxes. Well, it's funny but- to, to, to research both though, because you find how close we are to our Irish and Scottish neighbor, brethren. It's basically, you know, one big happy family of, 
distrust of the tax man. <laughs> so, <Yes. laughs> and the tax man constantly interfering and making us shift how we make our whiskey. So, yeah. Yeah. And so it's super interesting. And I just have to, to say, I have a new favorite whiskey of the night so far. Yeah. Napoge. Uh, is that how you pronounce it? I, uh, guess. I, I, I look, I, I listened <laughs> to a castle guy, whiskey. <laughs> I listened to a guy say it like 10 times before. Um, I actually pronounced it on a, on a podcast. So it is Napoge. He was Irish. Um, I'm not going to say it. Okay. Because I haven't researched it to know. <laughs> I don't want to say it the wrong way. But no, this, this one reminds me. Of, this, <laughs> That's why he wrote a book. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I just write it down. It. Yeah. Yes. This, this is, this is the one that kind of reminds me of scotch. Like okay. it's really fruity, peachy, kind of like a, a Dalmore. Yeah. Um, but anywho, there's a variety of different scotch. So can you talk or a variety of different Irish whiskey? So for the, for the listener, just what's baseline to be an Irish whiskey? Oh, to jump into the rules. Uh, <laughs> that, that part would be a little, uh, uh let, let's, let's talk about the styles. There's, yeah. there's a uh, single grain. Yep. The, now the word single is what you have to be careful of because single means single distillery. It doesn't mean, so when you hear single grain, that doesn't mean that it's just using one grain. It can use a variety of grains. Mm -hmm. uh, what's interesting about Irish whiskey is I don't remember the exact degree, but it can get up to, I think they can distill up to 94.7 or something like that uh, percent. And as long as it still has some character of the original grain, it is acceptable. And I actually do put the rules in the book. I see and you pulling the Scott's book. Scott's thumbing through the book right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, because um, we can't screw it up because you know we're what's, we're teaching here. Yeah. yeah. Well, and what's interesting is some of the differences are they can use any kind of wood. They don't have to use oak. Yes. So that opens a, a doorway. Uh, it has to be aged for three years. So unlike bourbon, which doesn't have to do anything except sit in a wood container for a second. Yeah. Uh, it, it Unfortunately, the, uh, <laughs> the, the miss, uh, miss, what is it? What were we saying? People misunderstand what the requirements of bourbon, but yeah. those people really know. Cause they think yeah. straight. They think it should be two years. To, they're you they're know. going by the straight rules. Yeah. yeah. That's the, what bourbon should be. Yeah. The, be. the, the best story is, is Jimmy from Russell going over there and taking an oak bucket, pouring distillate in it. That's bourbon. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's 94.8% ABV. 94.8. So they, okay. they can almost distill it. Yeah. I mean, and what so, we would say here in America is grain neutral. Right. And so what they did was they, uh, the, the coffee still was invented there. And they asked coffee, who was Irish. Actually, it wasn't Irish. I think he was French. And then moved to, at an early age, to Ireland. But anyway, he's the one that uh, came up with it, uh, with or developed one. There was one already in development, but he improved upon it, so his name got attached to it. And it, this, it because we use a single column and a thumper, we can control and keep it under 160. There's, it's a little bit harder uh, with those column stills to. Uh, so they do distill higher than High. this. What's interesting is when I went to Jameson. And when I went to Middleton, the woman who was talking about whiskey and trying to teach her audience, she said, um, Scotch is, or Irish whiskey is triple distilled. Scotch whiskey is double distilled and American whiskey is single distilled. <laughs> I went, where did she get that from? And then she went on and she was doing a diagram and she was trying to draw it. She says, I want you guys to understand, um, you know, basically when we're going through the process, you know, when it's wart, it's probably 8% alcohol. Then we distill it the first time and then it's, uh, you know, 35, 40, something yeah, like that. 40. Next time we distill it, it's up to 60 something. Next time we distill it or higher than that. And then the next time we distill it, it's 74. Now, if we distill this to 74 degrees, let's flip it over the other way and we'll, we'll say, you have, uh, if it's 74, that means you only have 26% flavor. I thought, is that what, is she really saying this right He's now? Like scratching, his, <laughs> scratching his head. Trying you're, to do the math. You're basically telling me that, uh, that there's, that you've basically distilled all the flavor out of your whiskey. And I'm going, that's why Jameson, like, to me, <laughs> I have to put like a drop shit. of something in it to get it to taste like something. 
I, my, my trick is always take a couple drops of Lafroig and put it into Jameson and you have a peated whiskey. Yeah. And it works it really just, well. It just over, yeah. overtakes the, yeah. I mean, Jameson is it, it's, admittedly, it, it tastes like nothing. Right. But, but, <laughs> but I get like a graham cracker note out of Jameson. It just tastes like, like, but it Vanilla does the job. Grand, it's a good yeah. shooting whiskey. It uh, it, it does the job one day a year. I name I named this American. I named my son after it without any intention. Um, but you had that. Um, speaking of Jameson, you had a really interesting Jameson a couple years ago. Um, it was the, the stout cask. The stout cask I thought yeah. was really good. So when you get into the cask finishes, yeah. Yeah. it turns out to be a really nice whiskey. But, but that's the thing. You're taking a nice clean distillate. Yep. And you're adding something else to it to give it some personality. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, it has its place. Mm-hmm. And I, and I don't. I definitely don't want to be the person that goes. You know, that's beneath me to drink Jameson. I've had Jameson in my cabinet, at, but it serves a purpose. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, um, Irish car bomb. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> We're coming up to. I don't know when this will release, but no, this is actually going to be our our St. Patrick's Week episode. Ah, okay. Well, there you go. Okay. So we we are we'll we'll be celebrating. So I will stop talking about Kentucky bourbon. <laughs> we'll jump right into Irish whiskey. No, I mean it, it's good because like you know th- there's similarities, but there's differences, right? And um, you know I think the the variety um, is is sat here on the table with a variety of different things. Like we have Midnight Silky, we have Powers, we have Slain. We've got Napoge. We have the Whistler Irish Honey, which is, you know, if you're making a uh, an Irish old fashioned, there you go. You have it in a bottle. You don't really need anything else. Um, I wouldn't say it's a sipping whiskey by any means. Um, Maybe over a cube, it might be. Yeah, yeah, but not not a neat pour. Uh, but there's just so much variety because of of the different types, like the grain, the single malt, the triple casked, which is very common. Um, and then the different distilling styles that, that deliver, you know, unique, uh, conversations, uh, to, to the whiskey consumer and drinker. Yeah. Well, well and uh, I was going through actually when we talked about, we stopped a single grain. Yep. So you got single grain. We talked about single pot still. Yep. So pot, single pot still is just, it's made up of, um, 30% Unmalted barley, 30% malted barley can have up to 5% of another grain, which they're now determining oats or wheat or any other number of corn or rye. Yeah. Could do corn. Although corn's interesting because corn isn't really a flavoring grain as much as it is. Substance. Yeah. (laughs) It's the... uh, it, 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 it's hard to talk about corn. <laughs> Mellow corn. Oh, to, yeah. Let's to, talk about it. To, to Scott, <laughs> corn is a flavoring grain. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but then you've got, so then the rest of that recipe can be filled up with either unmalted or malted barley. Because it's just it at least 30% right. of malted or unmalted. So what, what James was talking about uh, on the episode you did with him mm-hmm. with Sleeve League was the fact that in the old days, they were actually using 30% oats in those in those mash bills. And that's been lost because the rules were made yeah. when Jameson was, when Middleton was the only distillery around. And so they got to make the rules. And it wasn't to punish anybody else and lock people in. It's just how they made their whiskey. So they said, this is what Irish whiskey will be. Um, and so, so you had your single pot still, and then you have your single malt. And so single malt, same as we'd be talking about in Scotland or American all malted barley. Yeah. 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 Well, I think like with, with Irish whiskey, one thing people might not realize if you've not looked recently is there's a similar or a parallel path that Ireland is going through with America. It's the craft movement. There's a lot of people that are saying, this is this is Irish whiskey. Like, yes, it's made in Ireland. It's whiskey. Yeah, but it's it's totally distinct from Jameson and everything else. And yeah. here's what we're doing different. Yeah, but they have some of the similarities, such as uh, here a lot of these new startup distilleries are getting their juice from MGP. In Ireland, a lot of them are getting them from Great Northern Distillery, or they're getting them from Middleton, or they're getting them from West Cork. 
Mm-hmm. So those are, you know, three suppliers who are supplying out good juice. We're talking about the Silky that came from Great Northern. Great Northern, yeah. Uh, and so Whistler, I'm not 100% sure on Whistler, but I believe Whistler actually also comes out of Great Northern. Mm-hmm. So, But it's the importance of, of the cask finishing or, you know, other things that they're doing to differentiate themselves. Right. Yeah, yeah, like right. Midnight Silky bringing the turf. We've had West Cork, though, like – you know, you, they sent us a bunch of stuff and I, I thought they had really good distillate and whiskey. I have a story. I haven't told this story to anybody yet. It'll be on my episode when, when it comes up, I went to West Cork and, uh, I was, uh, and we got done with the tour and we walked into the tasting room and, um, uh, Dennis, one of the founders was the one that was taking me around and we walked into the tasting room and he he poured, it pulled a bottle off the shelf and it was organic. It was called hummingbird whiskey or something. And, um, he, he kind of was looking like, okay, so we made this stuff and then he, you know, wasn't kind of giving it his, uh, a glowing, uh, review and the way he was talking about it, but he, he poured it out. He said, see what you think. And I tasted it. I went, there's something definitely wrong with this whiskey. And he looked at me and he went, what do you mean? It's not that bad, is it? I said, it's not that it's not bad. It's that it's not whiskey. It was, he said, oh, we gave you one of the display bottles. It just had colored water. In it. <laughs> <laughs> this is definitely not like any whiskey I've ever had. So <laughs> I, I'd have to go back and look, but that West Cork, I believe, is, is a non shell filtered whiskey. Mm-hmm. And it's at a lower proof point. And that will explain to you why distilleries chill filter because you saw it has clouds, so or? much flocking and okay like it's got sediment in it that's not barrel sediment yeah. it's it's literally like the the the, the fatty, fatty but don't we love the stuff you can chew on now you know it's real well like if i if i saw that as a consumer as yeah. a consumer i wouldn't grab that bottle because i would think there's something wrong with it I until to, i knew better yeah you know I have to tell you, I have not seen the cloudiness in a whiskey until just recently. And I walked into a store, and my mind wasn't even in that that arena. And it was an Irish whiskey, Lim- Limavati, and it was my second bottle of it. And I picked it up off the shelf, and I looked, and there was this like little, looked like a jet stream mm-hmm. in the middle of the bottle. I went, what a cool effect. <laughs> and then I went, oh, that's the lipid protein. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's what people think is a defect. I'm looking at it going, oh, that's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, you're like, yeah, pick the bottle up. You got to shake it five times. That's yeah. way, That's waves of flavor. <laughs> waves of flavor. There you go. Yeah. It's all in how you sell it. Yeah. I, and I, I think it, it's, you know, it's really interesting because a variety of these are, are pot still whiskeys. And so you get a lot of unique, funky flavors from, from that distillate. So as, as you, you know, you, you went to Ireland and you didn't really know a ton, you had an idea, yeah, right? Like what was like the main, like, aha that you had as you kind of started to go around to all these distilleries. And I, I think there's like 18 or 20 different ones that you, you, you go to, uh, throughout the book, you know, what was that aha moment that you had with Irish whiskey? I went to 44. 44. Okay. Wow. And actually talked with probably about six or seven other people who are starting them. So, um, yeah. At at all stages of development. At at all all, stages of development. First, the first distillery I went to was Tullamore Dew and they've moved from their downtown location, which was an old warehouse and museum into the actual distillery. And the first thing they do when you walk when you start on the tour is they take you upstairs and they take you into a room and start making you an Irish coffee. Oh, and they make an Irish coffee that is incredible. And she's telling the story of Irish coffee. And she's saying that, that, you know, going through the Shannon airport is where it uh, started. And someone in San Francisco came through and (laughs) was like, wow, you know, we need to make these. And then the cream came from the mayor of San Francisco at a a dairy and decided (laughs) to throw some cream on top of it. It This is this fascinating story. And then she brings these over for us to, to drink. And I'd only had an Irish coffee once before. And it was at a, pub that had no idea how to make a real they just they just put some jameson <laughs> into coffee yeah I'm like, oh, 
and which didn't like, like we me. all like to do, you know, some mornings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it kept me from drinking Irish coffee because I thought that's what it was. Yeah. And then I had this one and it was so incredible. And then they went through the process and how you make the, the whiskey. And then we went back into a, into their warehouse and they took us in and told us all about the, the barrels. And then we walked over into what they call a snug which is a little area now in Ireland, they used to, women weren't allowed in the pub, but if they did come in the pub, they'd have a little back corner they could sit in that they called a snug. So um, they kind of introduced us to that history. And then we got to taste something out of the barrel Mm. while we were sitting there amongst all the, the barrels there. And when I left, it was an hour and a half tour. And when I left, I said, this was really great. I walked in here with one experience of drinking Tullamore Dew probably seven years before and was not impressed and walked out going, wow, I would go buy a bottle of Tullamore Dew. This, the, I really enjoyed what I had. And this is a fantastic experience. They did a, now it's owned by William Grant, which is Glenfiddich and uh, Balvini. And so they, they've got experience in yeah. what they're doing. And so they did create a really great experience. So I got off on the right foot immediately mm. on the first tour I went on. Now, the issue I had was with a Kentucky book, I paid for all those tours myself. And I didn't tell anybody I was coming. I just, I was secret shopper experiencing these things for myself. I couldn't do that in Ireland because so many of these distilleries weren't even open yet. Yeah, They were getting ready to open. And maybe they had some product on the market, but they were still getting their still set up or this was their first one distillery I went to. I was there while they were running their very first run Run. of whiskey, whiskey through. That's crazy. Crazy timing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So as you, you go and experience those things, you know, one of the, one of the things that's become popular here in American whiskey is single barrels, right? So as you're tasting cash strength, Irish whiskey, like, What's the difference? Because of a variety of times, you know, you're getting these at 46 or 40 ABV. Um, like, how is that experience, you know, just from a, a, a tasting perspective? Because it's got to be a, a completely different experience than what you get in a bottle. I guess because I've also done scotch in the past yeah. and done tours and had the ability to taste cast strength scotch. Yeah. Um, not that different. More, just think about Irish whiskey and give it a little more impact. Mm. I mean, that's yeah. really kind of where you're at with it. The thing that I ran into was that there were distilleries, like for instance, when I went to uh, Bowan, which is where the Whistler comes from, they didn't have any anything but their Whistler, which is their source stuff. So when we did tastings, they were letting me taste their prized new make. So mm. they'd won awards for their new make whiskey. Uh, or their new make spirit. And so I was getting a chance to taste that rather than something that was aged. Now, are they are they selling that stuff? Or is that just distillery experience? Just, just a, a distillery experience. They don't actually have a visitor center yet. So mm-hmm. I was there before they even got the... It's an old car dealership that they are <laughs> turning into a distillery. And they've got the floor space for it, but they just have said, we want to do this right. And it's going to take a little time before we put it together. That's crazy. Yeah. So I, I guess, you know, reading through the, the book, and I've not read your, your other book uh, on Kentucky bourbon, but I'd like to say that I might not need to read that book. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> I probably would still learn a lot. But yeah. uh, in this, this Irish whiskey book, I was trying to think of like some of the parallels between like if somebody has one of our listeners has done a bourbon experience, multiple t- tours or whatever. And I got to the point in the book where you talked about the Irish whiskey, the three sixty distillery passport. Right. Would you say that's like a, a junior version of like the Kentucky bourbon trail or something like that to where it's an attempt to do something like that. Yeah, the, the thing I would say, uh, if you want to get a frame of reference for where Irish whiskey is right now, it's in the same place. Tennessee whiskey is. Okay. It's the, there are established brands that you know yeah. that everybody knows. There are some upstarts who have made a name for themselves. So Tennessee, you got your Chattanoogas and your Nelsons. 
uh, in Ireland, you would have your Dunvilles and uh, um, maybe um, uh, Dingle a Distillery like that or Waterford that uh, has gotten the name, Clonakilty be another one. And then you have your ones that are just, you know, getting their feet under them. Sleeve League's a good uh, one for that. Crawley is right up the road from them. Uh, Lock Gill, which Sazerac just bought. Yeah, uh, those are all just getting started, and so you have that in Tennessee too, where you have your little small ones that are getting their their feet wet, and so Tennessee has a whiskey trail, um, and there's a lot of distilleries on it, but the it, the Kentucky trail, you're gonna get an even experience, mm-hmm. no matter what the size. Usually at the end of the tour, you get a Glen Cairn glass or something to take with you. Some of them do a chocolate tasting. Some of them, yeah. Don't. But for the most part, you know, there is a f- slight formula to Kentucky tours, and most Kentucky distillers follow that formula. Tennessee is not that way. You walk in, and they, they you may meet the <laughs> distiller, and the distiller say, "Yeah, I'll yeah, show yeah, you around. Yeah, come on through." Exactly, <laughs> yeah. and you get that in Ireland. You now know? there are a few in Kentucky that are like that. Barrel House in Lexington, uh, Barrel House, yeah. or you know, on a Saturday you get you'll get Corky at Peerless. Well, that's, that's true. true or yeah. go out to uh, Western Kentucky because a lot of those distilleries are. Uh, Bard is a good example. You know, I mean, the yeah. owners are there working. Yeah. So you're going to get that experience too. Well, and so I think that's the, I think that's the parallel. It's not the heritage brands. You, you'll get that at, at Middleton or, you know, um, Teeling or whatever, but it's, it's the, the craft brands that are popping up. You're going to get the craft experience that you would here in Kentucky, which I think that's where, it, or, or Tennessee, or I've not been to Colorado, but Colorado would be like, if I were to pick a, a two, yeah. On where I would look at whiskey in America, Colorado would be my two. Mm. Um, yeah, well, Col- there's, Colorado there's would be my three because Tennessee would be my two. Well, because you're you're writing a book on Tennessee. <laughs> well, and because I see the the I, I see a range of things going on in Tennessee, and I think there's a lot of places in Tennessee that people don't know about. Like postmodern is one of my favorite American single malt, mm. but people don't know about it. You got to go to Knoxville to experience it. Ain't nobody. In this household, going to Knoxville, <laughs> as, as we sit in Jake's basement with with Kentucky surrounding us, there's a reason why Jake is yeah. not talking about Tennessee. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but the, the reason why I, I think Colorado is interesting is because you have established brands like a Hands, but then you have, you know, Boulder, which is made by a Scotchman. Or right. you have or Talnua, Talnua, which is which is, uh, which is an Irish style. That's where I learned about yeah. Potstill. Man, yeah. actually, I t- I interviewed him first before I went to Ireland. And I'm like, I feel prime for Ireland. They <laughs> did they do it right. I mean, like, yeah, they, they have, are true to style, right? Yeah. So, like, I I think the varietal of stuff coming out of Colorado is so big, and then you have Coors, who is now partnered into this partnership with Bardstown Bourbon Company and bringing the Rocky Mountain water. And it's going to, let's be honest, I'm, I'm not, I'm not breaking any news here, but fat tire will get into this whiskey game <laughs> before too long. <laughs> Probably. Um, and you know, say what you want, but they, you know, hot take. If you don't know, they're, they're coming out with a brand new fat tire. They're getting rid of their old one. New Belgium. Is I coming cannot up and, believe that. Why would they do that? I don't know. Like it literally makes no sense. Yeah, no, we're not talking beer, but you know, <laughs> li- I mean, maybe we'll cut. You this. start to lose me with beer because it's like I'm so I've been so into whiskey. They have the last few years. N- New Belgium has built their brand on, on fat, fat tire. tire. Yeah, and they just changed the recipe. Yep. I'm just what? like, what? The-? They changed the packaging so it looks nothing like what it used to. Yep. Like, why would you just not do a line extension? Yeah, blew my mind. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not a beer drinker. But look but- what look what Chattanooga did. Chattanooga yeah. was doing the MGP and they just cut it and said, that's it. If you want it, go get a bottle because we're releasing our stuff and, and it's, it's with going this. to be different. They were lucky though. It was their good. stuff was really it was good. good. <laughs> yeah. they, they got lucky. Yeah. 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 Well, and, and they came out with that. The, you know, the weirdest thing about Chattanooga is, is the soft cork. Like that's just the weirdest thing yeah. to me. Uh, I, I kind of like it. I, I mean, like it as long as it doesn't fall out of the bottle. Yeah, <laughs> but so that's why I think Colorado is super unique, and I would compare it maybe more to to Ireland is because of the different style. Because there's so many different styles of whiskey being produced in Ireland. Yeah. There's so many different styles of American whiskey being produced 
in Colorado from single malt to uh, rye to bourbon to high malted bar- uh, bourbons. Yeah. yeah high malted. You, you're getting just a, a wide range of things. Yeah. Um, and if, if you haven't checked out Colorado whiskey, check it out. That's Drew's going to be his fourth book. You, <laughs> that you didn't know about it's like now you're you, giving me more ideas. You, well, you're reading my mind because I am a big fan of Colorado whiskey. My thing, I think the only reason, and this is no slight on Irish whiskey, but, I, when I think of markets that are really doing it right with almost every distillery that I have come across, Colorado to me is like quality wise mm. way up. Oh, yeah. When you're talking about number of distilleries, I would do Tennessee second because there's a wide variety and they're spread out. And a lot of people don't know what's there, um, but it's more like Ireland where you have some really great whiskeys you have Some a lot of good whiskeys and then we don't we don't know what's coming yeah because we're still on so much sourced whiskey that we're not sure exactly what is their distillate going to taste like once it's been in the barrel for three years yeah, yeah. So. no it, it's super interesting and so i'm glad you bring us back to the irish so you, you your big aha was that you know you you went and you started off really well with tell or uh, tell them more do tell them more do. Yep. And so, you know, from there, like you start off on a good foot. Was there a moment in this, you know, trip where you're going and experiencing all these distilleries that you're like, should I really be doing this? No. So there was never a moment of like, <laughs> I never said I was so looking forward to it because I'd already reached out to all of these distilleries and had little conversations back and forth uh, about, you know, when can we schedule and get all that stuff? And I tell you 24 days and trying to schedule 44 distillery visits, you know, I was just absolutely floored by how welcoming everybody was mm. and willing to work around what I was doing. So in a way, I had enough skin in the game from that standpoint that the thought never crossed my mind of not doing it. Um, and honestly, I think heading north was my best move because uh, growing up in the mountains of North Carolina, yeah. the Scots-Irish, that whole influence, when you go to Ulster, those are the Scots-Irish. Mm-hmm. That, that's where the Scots came over. And that personality is there. Yeah. And I felt like I was at home mm. and it eased me into the rest of the trip. Mm. And so it just for me, it was, um, I, I, I went to two distilleries or three distilleries. I went to Glen, uh, great Northern slain and old Carrick mill, which is a, is being built into a 300 year old mill, uh, all on my f- second day. Oh, wow. And those were all in, um, Ireland still, but then I spent the next week mm. in Northern Ireland mm. and, um, that's like a whole day for, for those who, who are not <laughs> familiar with it. Like, wait, aren't we talking about the same place? No, <laughs> you're not. It's, it, it's worlds apart, worlds apart. It's just completely different. I guess in a way, but I mean, just from a, like, a, uh, I felt like the, the moment I was in Northern Ireland, the people just are a little different. Yeah. Like, you know, down south you have your city people and your Dublins. Yeah. And then there you have your you have your Northern Ireland people. <laughs> that are the, you know, like they're like your 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 Pittsburgh person. Like, you know, they they they, they grew up tough. Yeah. And they got they got their Well, their, and maybe that's why another reason I get along with them because I'm originally from Detroit. Yeah. And when I go to Scotland, I always fly to Glasgow and I I start my trips off from Glasgow, which is a blue collar town and yeah. a rough past. Belfast. I tell the story on my birthday. I was at uh, McConnell's for their uh, sherry whiskey launch party. And then we did some drinking over at the Duke of York after that. And then it was 2 a.m. And I said, oh, crap, everybody's going to get taxis. I took the bus here. <laughs> Shit, the bus and doesn't the run. the bus isn't late. running at 2 o'clock in the morning. But uh, And maybe it was because I had quite a few Guinness in me and qu- quite a bit of whiskey. But I picked up my phone, looked at it, and said, 44 minutes to walk back to my Airbnb. Ah, oh, heck, I'll just walk. I walked through Belfast <laughs> at 2 o'clock in the morning. You didn't get robbed. Thursday night or Tuesday <laughs> night. Um, I wasn't worried. 
Yeah. Um, but I had I had taken the bus in and I'd been watching, kind of getting a, a sense of the scenery. But when you've grown up in a, I mean, I've gone to Detroit uh, yeah. to take pictures of the architecture downtown because it's very Detroit is an incredible city, which is it's unfortunate. Yeah, some of the things the, that they went through over the years. But but I, but I had no issue walking around down there. It's got, I guess somehow you get that bred into i lived in philadelphia for a year and oh the, shit the, if you get if you can survive detroit and philadelphia <laughs> you can survive anywhere so belfast and glasgow are like ah, yeah that's as easy yeah so uh but so i think it was i'm probably not the best person to ask because for me i just felt comfortable there mm-hmm. and i felt comfortable on the rest of the, the you know donny gall uh up there um uh, everybody very friendly down through the south same experience. I just, um, I've heard people say, if you go to Ireland, don't go to Dublin, go <laughs> to the rest of Ireland. I get that to a certain extent. It's like when I went to Paris, um, I thought I enjoyed all of France, but Paris to me was just too big city. Um, it wasn't that it was impersonal. But you got to go though, it's right? You busy. can't say, but, you, yeah, there's you, a thing that you got to go. Oh, I went to France, but it didn't go to Paris. Yeah. Like, what? Yeah. <laughs> But well, but Dublin, I I think people do need to go to. I would not dissuade anybody from going to Dublin. Well, so don't go to the touristy parts of Dublin, right? Yeah. To although the- I, I advise people to go to the Irish Whiskey Museum if you go because it's a fantastic kickstart to. Yeah, but don't go Irish to Temple's journey. Court, right? Like where you're going to. Yeah, the Temple Bar. Yeah, you're going to be. Yeah. Uh, there's places around Temple Bar that are great to eat. Yes. But not Temple Bar. Yeah, no. Walk in, see what it looks like, and then go somewhere yeah. else. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 it's, and, and it's great if, if Celtic is playing or if um, the Irish home team is playing. So when we were there, Ireland actually had a home home game uh, and they, they were footballing. And to see the, the group come through, we were sitting, we were actually ate in Temple Bar area. Uh, and we were like sitting over the balcony and we saw everyone come down because we knew it was happening. So we just wanted to experience that. So that was really cool. That was a great experience. Yeah. I want to go to a hurling match. Uh, <laughs> the hurling is this <laughs> fascinating. I walked into a bar. This was my, um, it was my off day. So I, I scheduled two off days for myself. So I'm a vacation day- from the vacation. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so I, uh, I'm in Skibbereen. And uh, Skibbereen is down at the very southwest corner. And like Glasgow, the accent is very tough. And this is the day I decide to go into a pub and sit there and they have the hurling championships on. And I'm sitting there watching them and I'm fascinated. And the guy next to me keeps talking to me. And normally if I have somebody next to me who's talking and I don't understand them, I seem to be able to shake my head in acknowledgement enough that they kind of think I'm, I hear this guy kept looking at me like, I know you don't understand what I'm saying. This guy, (laughs) do you even speak English? You ain't ain't from around here, pal. (laughs) I went to all of the, all of Ireland, all the way around Ireland. That was the one place that I just had the hard time understanding people. Yeah. But no, I I would say go to Dublin myself. I thought Dublin's a, Gorgeous city. It's beautiful, yeah. Um, and, you know, the Book of Kells and all that stuff is is a phenomenal tour. Surprisingly, the hop on, hop off bus was the best way to get around. Yeah. Um, and it's... Europe knows how to do public transportation. Oh, a thousand percent. <laughs> uh, and, and like... That's something we don't know out here. I yeah. Mean, uh, it, like, well, and it's it's 50 degrees and rainy pretty much all the time there. You'll, you'll be fine. Just... Bring a rain jacket. Right. Like, so it, it today was a perfect day to talk Irish whiskey because today's weather was exactly. pretty, pretty Shit. Irish way. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Compared to yesterday, which was sunny and almost 65. I wouldn't know. I was in Pittsburgh. Um, <laughs> weird. And it was cold and rainy there. Um, but anywho, you know, what was the, the high point that you had uh, from a, a distillery experience? So, you know, while you started off on a good foot, what would you say was that one distillery that really stood out to you experiential or the liquid or what have you that kind of, of the 44 kind of stood out the most? So it wasn't long in, um, I will say great Northern was amazing to see because mm-hmm. it's not something you can tour. So, so is that like the G the MGP? Yes. Of, yeah. yeah. The Getting MGP go through there. And unfortunately, Brian Watts, the guy who took me through passed away not too long ago. So, oh, wow. uh, it was, uh, 
it was a shock because he is a big reason why Irish whiskey is where it's at right now. But two distilleries actually really close to each other in Northern Ireland. One was Cologne. Cologne is a shack. And you have to drive down a little one single lane road to get to it for about three kilometers before you get there. And then there's really not a lot of room for parking. I talk about it in the book and I say, if you contact Brendan, he will show you around, but he's definitely not going to have a regular tour kind of thing going on because there's just no room up there. But when I showed up, it's like, He's uh, oh there he is he's over well he met me at the car that's the only place where I had the um, you know distiller come out and meet me at the car and then he said yeah let me show you around and he takes me over and he's malting oats he's like I'm a little busy right now but we'll, we'll do this together <laughs> well he's he's in the middle of of process he's got these little Portuguese uh, stills that he's using and then he's over here with his little uh, smoker where he's smoking his oats. And then uh, he's taking me in. We're tasting blends he did of uh, Kalila with um, and put it in a sherry cask with uh, Bushmills. I think it was Bushmills uh, single malt. And then he's doing rye experiments and he's doing pachin and he's doing uh, rums. He, he's just like, like making everything he can possibly make in this thing and just experimenting. And the stuff he's making is amazing. I mean, I'm drinking clear spirits and I'm going, this stuff is phenomenal already. He sounds like Alan Bishop. Yeah. No kidding. <laughs> as, as he kind of said that, I'm like, has, has this guy met Alan? I'm like, like he, he might be, he might be like cleaning the floors, but he's also over here malting or, yeah. you know, doing something crazy. Is he, is, he a, is, he a, is he a closet chain smoker? That is the question you have to ask yourself. <laughs> Because uh, man, a a Alan's a character. Alan is the character of American whiskey. Yeah. So I, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, but that's it's what, like yeah, that's what it sounds like. <laughs> so so I had that, and then the next day, I went to uh, Eklundville. I didn't know what ex to expect out of Eklundville. Interestingly enough, Jarleth, uh, who took me on the tour through, um, he said as soon as I came in, he said, "I've been listening to your podcast." He said, we got to talk about James Bond. So <laughs> we ended up spending the first 30 minutes I was there just chatting about James Bond and who's who's the best and all that. And then um, he started pulling the whiskeys out. Now, they use their whiskey. A lot of it is coming from Cooley, mm. which Cooley was what John Teeling had bought. It was an industrial distillery, and he bought it in 1987 and then converted it into making whiskey, and that's where – um, you know, Connemara and um, Kilbegan come from was they started distilling at that distillery, and so um, uh, it was. The thing is, is that there are some distilleries that use that that juice, but when um, Beam Centauri bought it in 2012, then they shut off all their contracts. Slain was getting yeah. their whiskey from there uh, and uh, and so on and so forth. There were a bunch of people who kind of got left out in the cold when that happened. Well, somehow Dunville's got back in there and was able to, or um, Eklundville was able to get back in there and get some of that whiskey. Mm. And they actually are one of the first distilleries of the new generation to get started. They started around the same time Dingle started in 2012. Mm. However, they have never released their own spirit. They have nine-year-old whiskey getting ready to turn 10, and they have not released a drop of it. Wow. They're <laughs> holding on to it because they want to create a whiskey that will be like uh, like a brandy, will be seasonal or yearly, an annual release. So if you buy Dom Perignon, you're buying a particular vintage of it. And so they're going off the vintage system with what they want to do with their own whiskeys. But the whiskey that they're selling right now is the Cooley stuff that they've been aging for years, and that is the Dunvilles. Mm -hmm. And okay. I had a 21-year-old Dunvilles sherry cask. Um, I'm a Glendronic fan, big Glendronic fan. I said, this is better than Glendronic. I was floored. <laughs> 
I said, this is just amazing. And so this will tell the tale. When I flew home, I only had a certain amount of whiskey that I was going to bring back with me. He gave me five bottles. All five of those bottles came home with me. <laughs> I said, I am not losing these. These, <laughs> these I will taste. Because I knew I couldn't find them here. The Dunvilles we have on the, sh the shelf here, the PX cask is a 10-year. Um, and then they have a peated uh, and they have a, a, a younger sherry cast version that they do. They're all good. I mean, everything I've had from Dunville so far has been amazing. And what's cool about it, and I write about it in the book, is that the plan is that they will do everything on that estate, from growing the grain mm. to malting the grain yeah. to distilling the grain to barreling and then bottling. Very Balvini, yes, Glenfiddich type, yes, um, or where, Spring Bank, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which I think that grain to glass model uh, is starting to become popular in the states, but you know, for, for that growing region, barley is perfect, yeah. right? Like it, it's not perfect in every location in America, and so I think having that and then adding the other cereal grains that they may use, um, which. They're in great grain growing climates. Yeah. And I, I think that's what makes Ireland and Scotland super unique is they can grow the best flavoring grains. Yeah. Well, now a lot of the the barley will come from France, actually. Really? Yeah. Even in Scotland, a lot of that barley comes from France. That's why when I did the uh, Amoric tasting, uh, Amoric whiskey comes from a Celtic region of France. And they do a peated whiskey, and I, I was like, "This is as this is close to an Isla. It's not that far off from an Isla in terms of the personality." And they said, "Well, you know, a lot of this grain that they grow here, uh, they can now they have to get the peat from Scotland because they can't dig peat in France. Yeah, even though they have peat bogs around, they can't they can't do it. Is that uh, a, is that a legal restriction? Legal yeah. Thing. yeah, yeah. And Scotland's actually getting into a situation where they're yeah, now that's... worried about." Big time. L losing it as well. Um, so what's funny is one of the distilleries I went to in Ireland, um, it's actually sort of a distillery. It's a little micro distillery, um, uh, Loch Ree. They uh, That town, basically, that they're in, they're trying to bring industry back to the town because they had a peat plant, a turf plant, that supplied power. And oh. so they, back then they were, you know, that, that was a fuel source, even on a large scale. Huh? <clears throat> so it's kind of interesting. This is the fun part too, about doing all of this travel. You learn so much about the, um, why are things the way they are? Why are things the way they are and the culture Yeah. and what made these places, what they are. And uh, because they're telling these stories in a lot of these distilleries, Crawley Distillery up just north of Sleeve League, they've taken an, over an old doll factory. And when you, uh, the doll factory before that was a carpet factory that, <laughs> that did carpet for the Titanic and the White House. Wow. So they have that heritage as well as they're going to have food there that they're going to be serving that is local fare, stuff that the locals eat. So you can go in the cafe after your uh, whiskey tasting. And if your family's from Donegal and you go up to research your family's history or experience, your, go to the distillery because you're going to get some of that experience right there. Yeah, Bringing it back to the book, the thing I enjoyed about this, and I'm definitely going to be hanging on to this book for whenever my wife and I do make the trip, uh, which we've talked about forever, there's just a lot of practical advice in here. Like you did it. Yeah. Like yeah, I did it. Here's my crazy story of how I did 40 plus distilleries <laughs> in 20, you know, yeah. 20 days, but there's just practical advice in here. And I'm sure over time it'll probably change. Like you say in here, it's well, going to be exciting. will probably go away and so, and a lot of new ones will come. Yeah. Along. It's, yeah. it's like you say, a lot of these distilleries can't wait to see what they're coming out with. Yeah. But some of the, the advice in here is just, it's evergreen. It's like, how do you travel 
via bus. Like, where should you stay? How should you plan your trip? Like, right. what are you wanting to do? My, my favorite is uh, how to drive on the left side of the road. Because that's, a, that's you, something that will keep a lot of people from going to Ireland or something. It's like, how to approach a roundabout. I thought that was funny. <laughs> I was like, roundabouts are not supposed to be hard. But some people in Bardstown and E-Town and other places where roundabouts are a foreign thing, they're very hard for yeah. people to understand. Yeah. But Well, yeah. when, you, when you're driving uh, through... I was leaving Aberdeen, Scotland, and heading back towards Speyside, and you get into this situation where there's a roundabout every, every half mile. Yeah. And what I found is I got so tired of going into roundabouts that I got frustrated and just hit the gas going into one, and a car started coming, and I'm like, dude, don't do that. <laughs> I mean, just don't get frustrated. The, the worst troubles I got into driving were always... Uh, I almost had an accident when I was in Scotland that woke me up and I've never had an issue since then. I think there's a curiosity when you first start driving on the left side of the road and it's kind of fun and it's, yeah. you know, there's, there's a, uh, sense of uniqueness to it, but you don't necessarily take it overly serious until you're in the highlands and you're driving along the edge of a, of a cliff, a cliff where you yeah. can, and, yeah. and you've just left a place where you're frustrated because they were closed and you thought they were open and you've been driving for probably about a, a mile and a half to two miles. And suddenly you're rounding this corner and a truck is coming straight at you and you realize you're the one that's on the wrong side of the road because you've been in your head complaining to yourself about this place that, that didn't shut down. And that's why in the book I say, think left. Whenever you're in that car, whatever you have to do, think left because it's you. As soon as you pull out of a um, hotel or a and B and you get on the main road, your instinct is going to throw you on the right side of the road, and you have to Just keep reminding left. yourself. But what's interesting is when I came back to the U.S., I was driving. I was driving on a road that I don't normally take around my house. And I got on the left. I was like, wait, why am I getting on the left side of the road? Right side, right side. So it's yeah. amazing. Even after a lifetime, mm -hmm. yeah. they, they say it takes 21 days to develop a habit. I was gone 24 days. And that was enough to retool my brain to say left is right. So that's right. why he's got a habit for Irish whiskey. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So, you know, other than, other than the whiskey experience, you know, what was the, like the big Irish takeaway, right? Because Irish is such a really unique culture. You've talked about driving. We've talked about food, but like, what was the big, like Irish culture thing that you took away from the trip? Because 24 days is a long time to spend in a country. It is. Although I will tell you that when all you're doing is bouncing from distillery to distillery, you have no time really to look around. I mean, you, That's true. you see the countryside as you're driving past it. I stopped off at this one place and I'll talk about it in my podcast episode when I get to, it won't be long from now because I'm up to um, Northern Ireland, almost done with Northern Ireland on this recalling of my trip. Um, but there was a really uh, interesting place that I stopped off at that I don't remember the man's circum what the time period was. I think it was a time of the famine and this man who just lived out uh, and made a spot for himself. There's a castle that you can see off the the shore and this man living his solitary life in this spot with nothing. He's just, you know, destitute. Hmm. Uh, and that he became known around the area and there's a monument to him now and all of this. And you start thinking about the people and you start thinking about the history and all the stuff that you've, you've heard about and you've kind of taken for granted again, growing up in Scots Irish territory in the mountains of North Carolina. Um, I've heard stories of the famine. I didn't realize there were two famines. There was a famine a uh, hundred years before that. That is what sent the initial amount of people across from, uh, from Ulster here, uh, which was pre-revolutionary war. And, um, and it was worse than the one in 1845 it was just in a shorter period of time, mm -hmm. uh, but the impact was much heavier. Uh, and so you see what they go through with all of that. And it makes you want to learn because as you're, you're driving through and you're seeing all these castles, you realize how little you know about mm -hmm. Irish history. 
Yeah. And it's not an easy history to, it's like Scotland. Scotland, the issue you run into is that every king and queen was a Mary or a James. It's like, okay. <laughs> One, two, ten, twenty. Let's get 20. another name. <laughs> yeah. Please help me figure this out because this is really getting confusing. And so you get, you know, some of that going on also in, in Ireland, uh, the names start running together, but it's a fascinating history. Mm -hmm. And then you start learning how these, uh, if you've seen the whiskey, the liberator, the liberator, Daniel O'Connell was the man who helped, uh, the emancipation of the Catholics yeah. and he was big friends with Frederick Douglass. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole story of how those two, uh, got to know each other and um, respected each other and, uh, and and that whole thing. And so when I went to where the Liberator comes from down in uh, 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 Killarney, it was interesting because I was talking to a descendant of Daniel O'Connell, who's the one that came out with the Liberator whiskey. And his house is like a museum when you walk in and he's telling you the story of all the, you know, and all these names I don't know, but he's talking about, you know, our family was in smuggling and we would, you know, we had, uh, first were traders, but then when the tax man came along, we shifted to smuggling. And so he's like, you need to go see this spot and this spot while you're along the, um, ring of carry. And that's where our smuggling was all taking place. And it's like, man, it's a whole history. There's so much more to discover. Yeah. And it makes you appreciate the landscape and the uh, the castles. You understand more of why they're there. Like, it was kind of fun that I did my first trip there as a castles tour. I went and kissed the Blarney Stone. And I went, and, which is a back backbreaker, by the way. You 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 kissed it. I did. Wow. Yes. Every every book that we read prior to to going was like, "Don't kiss the Blarney Stone," because <laughs> the locals take a pee on it. Okay. <laughs> I have the story behind that because I read that article also. Um, and I'm like, okay, when I go up, I'm definitely not doing this. But if you read to the end of the article, it was an Irish, Irish times article. And if you read to the end of it, it says April fools. And you look at the date and it was April 1st. So it, that, that's not true. There's no way they could, the locals could break in there. <laughs> It's tough to get in there. But don't let that keep you from what should keep you from kissing the Blarney Stone, especially when you're six foot six, is trying to contort your body backwards because I don't think people realize it's off the side of the castle mm -hmm. and you have to basically bend your body to where you somebody has to hold you as you're bending back trying to kiss this thing that is away from the building. So you're basically leaning out over it. Now there's a catch down there to keep you from falling to the ground. Thousand, yeah. but, but there's not one at the cliffs. People die at the cliffs every yeah, year. So there you go. From too much Irish whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> no, from too much stupidity because it's really windy. Yeah. Yeah. But this, this is making my trip planning very easy because I, I, I got to go. I mean, <laughs> oh, it's, it's always been on the bucket list. But. Yeah. Ireland's great. And, and the great thing about Ireland is it's really not a bad flight to get there. Like, I always, I'm a Delta person. So f connect to Amsterdam, fly, you know, Aer Lingus in to Dublin and Bob's your uncle. Yeah. Like that's just the, the way to go. Um, so, you know, thinking of, thinking of this as, as kind of the, the close out, you know, we'd be remiss at the end of all of this to not let you share with our listeners where they can buy the book. Okay. And, um, where they can find out more about yourself. Okay. So you can get the book. If you go into a bookseller, you can ask them to order a copy of it cause it's available worldwide. Um, it's just, I have to push to actually get it into particular stores if I want to do so, cause it's self-published. But um, if you go on Amazon, it's on Amazon. So just type in whiskey lore, and you'll find uh, you'll find that and the Kentucky book in there. Or it's experiencing Irish whiskey and experiencing Kentucky bourbon. Um, also, I've got um, uh, whiskey lore stories, which is my sort of Ken Burns ish style storytelling podcast, where I do the research, and here's where I I actually keep all my resources, just like I'm writing the book on my website for each episode. So you can go back and see where I got my information from. 
so I research and do those stories, and I'm telling the story of Irish whiskey right now in season six. But uh, if you start out in season one, you'll learn about bottled in bond and where that came from and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, if you want to know the history of whiskey, check out the podcast because, I mean, the storytelling is is the key part there. But yeah. Yeah. And then Whiskey Lore, the interviews just happened because I was interviewing such amazing people. Nelson was a great example. We talked for two hours and I was only going to use small clips out of that interview. I'm like, how can I throw all this away? So it's like, I need to put it out there so that people yeah. can listen to it. So I do a very long form, usually uh, digging into process and history and the rest on that. Um, and so those are my main outlets. And then I'm on all the socials uh, slash Whiskey Lore uh, and uh, probably most active, starting to get active on Twitter, but uh, probably more on YouTube where I do tastings. And I try to do the tastings as education. So uh, I don't only go through what the flavors of that whiskey are, but I try to tell you a little background on it as well. So he's also got a Patreon. Don't don't let him fool you. He's got I a, do. He's I got do. a Patreon that that we, <laughs> that we follow, and I uh, you know there's there's other content there too. So uh, you know. We're fans uh, over here. Scott and I are. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you. And and we appreciate the time tonight um, because not only just going in the book, but just talking about history and talking about whiskey in general. There's there's a lot less historians out there, um, and so it's it's good to you know have the the full picture when when you're putting together this whiskey puzzle that that's out there. So, Drew, we, we truly appreciate you you joining this episode of the Bourbon Lens and hanging out with Scott and I here. Um, and you know we're excited to you know, see what, what, what's next, uh, yeah. for you as you come out. So thanks everyone for listening to this episode. Uh, make sure you go follow uh, whiskey lore on your, on your favorite social apps and on your favorite podcast, uh, apps. As always, you can follow us on bourbon lens at Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And, um, you can drop us a line at bourbon lens at gmail.com or the bourbon lens at gmail.com. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, and as always, if you feel so inclined, give us a five-star review on your favorite podcast listening app. We truly appreciate it. And until next time, cheers. Cheers. cheers.